Good morning, uh, bonjour, uh, and thanks to the Council on Aging for this opportunity to speak. What does it take for governments to get serious about the rights of older persons? Does it take a death rate of 80% of older persons from a climate change event like we saw in British Columbia during the heat dome in 2021, when 756 mostly older, poor, and isolated persons died in a completely preventable event. And I think we're gonna to have to watch what's happening in the Eastern part of the country right now. Does it take Canada's long-term care homes having one of the worst records for COVID-19 deaths in the developed uh, world in the first waves of the pandemic? Does it take laws which dictate where older people can live, allows government to move older persons in long-term care as much as 150 kilometers away from family, friends, against their will, as recent legislation has done in Ontario? Does it take the fact that in 2022, it was estimated that one in 10 older Canadians experienced some form of elder abuse, keeping in mind elder abuse is underreported and the rates are likely much higher. There are many more examples that I could cite, but the point is, these are all violations of the rights of older persons. We at the International Longevity Centre Canada and the Canadian Coalition Against Ageism have been advocating that our government support a practical tool to help address these human rights gaps. We're demanding that the government support the adoption of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Older Persons. What a United Nations Convention is, is a legally binding document signed by member states of the United Nations, which sets out in detail the rights each country must bestow on its citizens. So think of it as a separate set of laws that would protect older persons' rights. Now we know conventions work for other groups and they have had a significant impact on the lives of those whose rights are protected in this way. Think about the increase in accessibility that has come out from the Convention for Persons with Disabilities or the drop of child labor by one third since the inception of the Convention on the Rights of the Child or the Convention on Women, which has resulted in law reforms such as the Canadian Domestic Violence Family Courts. So why don't we have a convention on the rights of older persons? For the last 14 years, there have been yearly discussions at the United Nations meeting on aging concerning the rights of older persons. These discussions focus on whether or not there are gaps in the human rights of older persons, and if so, what's needed to fill those gaps with a focus on whether or not we need a convention to protect the rights of older persons. I wanna take you back in time for a moment to look at Canada's impressive history in regard to human rights at the United Nations, which is something to be proud of. Canada was instrumental in drafting the seminal human rights document called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You'll recognize it from its famous and beautiful opening lines. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, which came out of the carnage of World War II. One not so insignificant fact is that this document never mentioned age. Canada is party also to seven major human rights conventions on issues which address, for example, racial discrimination, discrimination against women and children and persons with disabilities, as I mentioned earlier. Now proudly, Canada played a role in getting these conventions established and implemented. Yet Canada is not supporting a convention that addresses age and ageism. This despite WHO statistics, that show ageism is the most pervasive ism with one in two persons being ageist. Indeed, studies by the National Seniors Council, the federal provincial territorial ministers responsible for seniors and Statistics Canada have shown the incredible negative impact ageism has, ageism has on the lives of older Canadians. So where is Canada on the rights of older persons? From 2010 to 2018, Canada was openly opposed to the convention. In 2018, International Longevity Centre Canada brought a petition to the United Nations um, meeting on aging, calling on Canada to support the convention. In response, on the floor of the General Assembly of the United Nations, Canada announced that the door was open to the convention. But here we are, six years later, hearing the same thing. And quite frankly, this yes is really a definitive no, because until Canada stands up at the UN and says it supports the convention, our country remains listed as against it. So how does the government explain this inaction? Over the years, we've heard a number of reasons why they have not supported the convention. We have heard that there are no gaps in regard to the rights of older persons. 
So let me be crystal clear. That 700 plus older persons die needlessly in the BC heat drone is a human rights gap. Indeed, Human Rights Watch called out the governments of BC and Canada for their inaction. The older people who died in long-term care during the pandemic as a result of issues like the lack of personal protective equipment, the fact that workers in long-term care were forced to move from home to home, increasing infection rates, yeah. the overcrowding of rooms, or the fact that older people in long-term care were being barred from hospitals are all human rights gaps. The 300 older persons in Ontario who were forced to go to long-term care homes against their will is a human rights gap. Outrageous levels of elder abuse without sufficient funding for supportive services, much less safe havens, which can accommodate older persons, is a human rights gap. The United Nations Office of Human Rights has been clear that older persons face gaps in their human rights and that a convention is required. We urge Canada to align itself with the United Nations Human Rights Council and support a convention. These human rights gaps, which have been experienced by older persons, have been clearly described and verified in discussions at the United Nations on meetings, meeting on aging for the last 14 years. We urge Canada and any other countries opposed to a convention to scrutinize a multitude of reports from experts in the field of aging whose peer reviewed research has clearly illustrated that human rights gaps for older people exist and they have been presented at the UN year after year. Indeed, how on earth can anyone with an interest in human rights seriously say there is no gaps for older persons? Another argument we've heard both in Canada and from other countries who oppose the convention is that the current UN conventions um, cover aging and all we have to do is implement those conventions in a better way. Here's that problem with that. None of these conventions cover ageism and without a tool to battle ageism, the challenges facing older persons remain unaddressed. Seriously, imagine talking about the challenges of race without addressing racism or looking at women's rights without addressing misogyny. It's quite frankly ridiculous. So when you imagine if these other conventions have ever been used to address older persons' human rights, you will see they rarely do. In fact, many of them do not even mention age as a basis of discrimination. So saying there are no gaps in the human rights of older persons or that they are addressed by other conventions is simply not true. So Canada, we're proud of what you've done for human rights for others, but your work's not done. Canada needs to step up to the forefront and be in the vanguard of the rights of older persons. Now, there is some hope. This year at the meeting on aging, which took place last month at the UN, we had an astounding number of Canadian NGOs attending and speaking on the floor of the United Nations. And this is what it's going to take. We need to be present in large numbers. And so we hope to make those numbers grow. Also last month at the United Nations, which was ostensibly the last session of what was called the Open Ended Working Group on Aging, which has been going on for 14 years. Um, it was established to look at those gaps of older persons and the options to fill them in. Um, there was a paper that was agreed to at that meeting and it sets the stage for a new era in the rights of older persons with unanimous agreement on that outcome document. And it sets out options to fill in the gaps of the human rights of older persons and it includes the conventions. Discussions on the way forward were also explored, which include moving the work of the human rights of older persons to the Human Rights Council, which has a, num a smaller number of member states who make up the council and where it possibly could move forward into drafting. It was also recommended that a forum on older persons be created in the UN in New York uh, for annual meetings to look at aspects of aging issues. There was also a bit of a sea change in Canada through the week at the UN. Um, at the beginning, we saw the usual interventions by Canadian delegates outlining what Canada does for older persons, but without any reference of moving forward. But by the end of the week, Canada announced that it supported the movement of the discussions to the Human Rights Council and that it supported establishing a forum in New York at the United Nations to discuss issues of importance to older persons. Behind the scenes, there was also a lot of action. The week before, the ministers of seniors, um, Minister Reagan's office, contacted me to talk about um, the convention um, and that they he told they told us that while the issue was complex they were working um, behind the scenes to see if they can move it forward and we also heard uh, that the minister was making positive comments about the convention when he met this week with the National Association of Federal Retirees so we're uh, on the watch to see if, if a formal decision is rendered um, 
We also had what's called a side event at the UN meeting last month. Uh, and it was really interesting, particularly the speech given by Ambassador Ray, who outlined the diplomatic challenges and get it moving forward on the rights of older persons. He described sinister forces, which are those countries hiding behind national sovereignty as a way to avoid being accountable on human rights. And they did that by opposing conventions. These countries, Russia, China, Egypt, Cameroon, among and their proxies, are making it harder and harder to move forward on human rights at the United Nations. So it's really important that countries like Canada stand up and take on the world's bullies. I think one of the most um, uh, important uh, comment from Ambassador Ray was something he made on the side in an individual discussion in response to a question by a Canadian delegate on where Canada stood on the convention. And he responded, I have a few more ministers to convince. So we are really hopeful that he'll manage to do that. So we need to watch what happens at the General Assembly between now and September 10th, uh, when we hope that the decision will be rendered on the next steps. Um, there are actions you can take right now to help realize this goal. Join us in our work with the Canadian Coalition Against Ageism, which Kieran is about to describe to you, and help us make a United Nations Convention on the Rights of Older Persons a reality by working to convince our governments to get on board and to help us with the resulting international work. This can be done as an individual or as an organization. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margaret, uh, for setting the stage for, for my conversation. Um, and I also want to thank Pe um, Bonnie and, and all of you for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to pick up where Margaret left off uh, a, a minute ago and take a little deeper dive into exactly what it is that we're talking about here, why some of these the issues are happening, uh, and why are they happening now and not 100 years ago, for example. And so let me just start by saying that this is our these are our logos. We are sub sort of uh, byline is human rights do not have a best before date. And of course, we're here to, to solicit support for a UN convention as Margaret outlined. Um, let me see if I can. Um, so why is this happening? And, and in order to understand why this is happening, not just in Canada, but across the world, one has to take a look at history over the past 200 years. Um, so this graph outlines the population at two levels. The blue bars are the, um, the mean age that people live to at, the, at a given year. So in 1800, most people didn't live past the age of 30. In 1900, the mean age was 40, and this is across the world. In the year 2000, the mean age was 70. Now, if you look at the population, the, the figures that are highlighted in yellow, between 18 and 1900 in Canada, we didn't have enough data to even know exactly uh, what, what was going on with the population. But if you follow me with the second and the third columns here between 1900 to 2000 and population since 2000, our population has gone from under 5% being 65 years of age, which is 5.3 million back in the early 1900s, to 18.5% of the population being over the age of 65 in 2021, which means we have 38 million older persons, according to the national census in 2021. And our Canadian life expectancy is way higher than the global average because men, if you're a man, you live to about 80 years of age in Canada. And if you're a woman, you live to about 84. So this is part of the reason because in, in 1938, um, when the United Nations came up with their Declaration of Human Rights, most people didn't live very long. So aging was not really a phenomenon. And what, what's happened over the past few decades is that due to medical science and, and, and technology, et cetera, medications, 
we have a lot more people living to a ripe old age, which is actually a great thing, but we haven't quite figured out how to make their lives better. So people really struggle with what aging is. Like we look at ourselves in the mirror and think of different things as we look in the mirror. What is age? Some people think I'm too old at a certain age. And yet we want to change the narrative to no one is really too old because it is just a number. And so by definition, we call that ageism is the negative way society or ourselves think and feel and behave towards the aging process and specifically other against other older persons. And it happens in different settings. It happens within our own minds when we look at ourselves in the mirror which is self-ageism, but it also happens between people, that is interpersonal ageism, and it certainly happens in different institutions and in different sectors, including healthcare, where I work, and I have done this work for over 40 years, and I've seen lots and lots and lots of um, you know, human rights violations uh, with underlying causes ageism. Now, I'm going to talk about the interventions in a minute. I just want you to think about them. The, the antidote to this is really education, and we, but it has to be done in a combination of older persons and younger people, as well as the change in policy and laws. And Margaret has outlined some of the international pieces that we need to change in order to make life, a quality of life better for older people. So let's just briefly talk about, and this is for you to reflect on, what exactly sustains you? What makes you feel good? What is it that puts a smile on your face or deeply matters to you? Is it the fact that you want to have a little bit of autonomy and a sense of control over your life, some purpose, a sense of dignity, a sense of self-worth? And these are all important things for every human being. And these do not diminish as you get older. No matter how old you are, these are basic core concepts of being a human being. And when there's a negativity introduced into a person's life, this leads to social exclusion, invisibility, being marginalized. And Margaret has talked about lots of um, evidence in our own country. These things are happening in Canada. We're not talking about some low and middle income country here. We're talking about one of the richest countries in the world where we should not have any violence, abuse, neglect. Um, our healthcare system is supposed to be one of the best in the world. But with ageism, there's much higher rates of morbidity and mortality. And those of you who are um, more into the finance end of things, there's a cost associated with this, uh, with ageism, and I'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Now, if you look at perceptions of old age, people have different perceptions of what aging means. Uh, and these are quotes from the literature. Everyone gets old, but the process is subtle and complex as one's capacity and needs change. Age is not an interesting concept until one actually gets there. <laughs> Some say that it's a foreign country with an unknown language to the young and even to the middle age, because a lot of old people do not want to think of themselves as older because denial, minimization, and rationalization, is uh, those are very common defense mechanisms. Poorly understood and confusing. Fears of ill health, loss of independence, intimacy, and finances, often loom large in people's minds as they get older. And pre, you know, preconceptions and myths fill this vacuum. And these are often, uh, you often see this in stereotypes and humorous representations in social media and in films. Now, I, I mentioned that this is very, very pervasive. Uh, Margaret mentioned that one out of two people are at least, I should say, one or two people are ageist against older people globally. And this is according to the, the, the World Health Organization uh, Global Report on Ageism. Um, we also know from very good studies 
that most of these studies demonstrate very poor health outcomes in those who are subjected to ageism and, and especially affects mental health of those people. And depression is probably the most prevalent outcome in people subjected to ageism. Now, this next piece of information is really crucial because it has a massive economic impact. And there's very good data to show that in, just in one year alone in the US, we can, we're spending $63 billion more in providing care for people who are subjected to ageism. And not to mention, I think Margaret has very clearly outlined that this is not good for human rights. It, 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 it's a major barrier. So I just want to take a minute and have you reflect on what gives meaning to your life at, with age. Some people have a certain process of thinking where they feel that their own values are not in sync with their own aging process. And then it leads to this negativity that your life is over, you'll never amount to anything, you will never have friends, or you may just as well give up. And we see a lot more people in the hospital and in nursing homes and in physicians' offices who have a, a negative attitude towards aging versus the ones who are more positive who have a much better outcome. Now, this adage is very uh, appropriate here, that if we permit this to go on, we actually end up promoting it. And for everyone on this call or who is in the room, I would really urge you to think about what can we do as Canadians to stop propagating this myth and this, this concept of ageism. Now, in order to make this not just an individual's um, goal, we've created a Canadian Coalition Against Ageism uh, in November of 2021. Um, and this is basically a social change movement, which is nationwide. And our goals are to eliminate ageism against older people while we look for protection and strengthening of human rights of older people. And this is a little cartoon to demonstrate how this works. Think about this as a pyramid where the work that Margaret talked about, the United Nations, which is at the top of the pyramid, the World Health Organization, WHO, Human Rights Council, and all of the states, member states that work within that space are at the tip of the pyramid. Whereas people like you and I and Margaret and Bonnie, all of us together today, we live at the base of the pyramid, older people, civil society, and the middle portion of the pyramid are traditional and non-traditional partners from all sectors that connect the two. And what we are trying to do through the CCAA is to form a bridge between our human rights, which are enacted at the tip, versus those of us, who we, we all live at the base. So it's really to connect our rights to the process. And Margaret talked about this a few minutes ago, that this is the 75th anniversary of the United UN's Declaration of, of Human Rights and the 14th year of the open-ended working group that's been meeting at the UN with very little movement until this year, when there's a little glimmer of hope that we might be able to go somewhere further ahead with this. And the conventions that we currently have on people with disabilities, children, women, and minorities have a huge impact, positive impact on, on those populations. So I think that it would be very wise and timely for us to, um, to, to enlist the support our, of our Canadian government to uh, promote and protect the human rights of, for Canadians by supporting the UN Convention on the Rights of Older People. So coming back to the CCAA at the ground level, our goal, which is to, to create this social change, and you can all be part of this, and we need you to be part of this, to transform the policies and the practices, the social norms, the power dynamics, and the way people think about aging and older people. And the way we would like to do this is to invest in evidence-based strategies 
to improve data and research because we find that we don't have any good, really great data on, on, on older people and change the narrative around aging and aging and the process of aging. And this is a, a multi-year, multi-pronged collaboration of all of us across different sectors and different and, and disciplines. As I said earlier, our vision is to create a Canada free of older of ageism against older people. And we have <clears throat> four objectives. One is to develop, <clears throat> excuse me, this as a national campaign uh, and to anchor this campaign in the World Health, Health Organization's um, evidence-based interventions. And the, the WHO recommends three aspects to the, to the interventions. One is education that goes from, from being education across the entire lifespan from people's uh, homes to kindergarten, all the way up to universities, different healthcare disciplines, and across all, uh, um, all aspects of education, combining the different generations, and thirdly, to influence the policies and laws, which themselves are ageist and, and barriers to, to um, ha having older people experience a positive outcome. Um, really looking at um, ensuring the success of this campaign by impacting the synergies of all of the collaborations and networks of every sector in Canada. We um, have established a common agenda. We're looking for organizational partners and stakeholders, as well as individuals like yourselves to join us on the campaign. Um, when we launched the, the coalition, we'd done an informal survey of a number of organizations and associations and these are the 16 different ways that ageism is permeates our society. So um, awareness is one, thinking about aging in a different way, in a positive way, looking at policies and laws which are ageist, uh, looking at healthcare, dignity, and you can read this list as, as well or quickly, quicker than I can read it out. But the four that I want to highlight that have bubbled up to the top are awareness, lack of awareness, or, or awareness itself. The healthcare sector has been one of the top priorities in, in all of the organizations that deal with older people, gender inequality and elder abuse. Not to say that the others are not important, they're equally important, but people have identified those four areas as needing the, the highest level of, of urgency to, to address. Um, we're looking at different drivers for our campaign. Uh, the biggest group that we need to start from are older people themselves and how they're affected by this, along with all the other ones that we have listed here. And there is a box for others because clearly these are some of the main ones, but they, they're not um, exclusive. And I'm sure you can think of other partners that, that we can engage with. Um, there are different resources that are required. Obviously, we need people's time. We also need the spheres of influence, which everyone in this room has a huge sphere of influence and good connections. We need key opinion leaders to help us to amplify the messages that we have. We need ambassadors and we need your brain power. We need your ideas and thoughts. I put finances down and obviously money is important, but it's not the only component here. I think the top six ones are, are we've listed them above the finances. Um, I'm going to finish up in just a, about two or three minutes, but I want to remind you that if you haven't read this report, I would please urge you to have a look. This was published in March of 2021. Um, if you look it up under WHO's Global Report on Ageism, all of the work we're doing is based on this report. Um, Looking at shifting the culture of care and support, as well as other aspects of ageism, we want to make this very evidence-based or science-based, but also human rights and person-centered. Um, you might wonder what PRISM-based is, and PRISM is a coin, is a term that we've coined, which encompasses protecting against all isms. Ageism is only one big part of the isms, but it intersects with all the other isms like 
sexism, racism, etc. And finally, accountability is very important because if you don't have any teeth or culpability built into it, then it just becomes a piece of paper that no one actually respects or follows. So we do need accountability based into it. The, the kind of work we do, one of the pieces of work is combating ageism but it, through, through ILC Canada and our partners. Uh, we're looking at healthy aging as being an important part of our work, enabling functional ability and addressing inequities across different parts of the Canadian and international work that we do through ILC Canada. Um, I'm going to skip these. I um, want to tell you a little bit about the partners. We currently have 14 major partners that are listed here. Um, and together, we have a reach of over 12.5 million Canadians through our partnership. But we still would, we're still recruiting people to join the coalition. Um, anyone can join it. There's no fee, there's no charge but we do need your support. Um, you can simply scan this QR code or, or um, there's a bit.ly link to it uh, on top here or write to one of us, Margaret or myself, or you can write directly to membership at ccaaageism.ca. I'll stop at that point um, and pass it over to Bonnie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh... Uh, Karen and uh, Margaret, we will be opening up for questions. So for those of you online, you can drop your uh, question in the chat. Uh, and uh, if there are uh, questions in the room, uh, you can uh, share them with uh, uh, Sarah. First question oh. about uh, CCAA. Uh, what kind of budget do you have? you want to answer that or do you want me to take a step? I think I'll leave that one to you, Kieran. Okay. Um, so okay. at the present time, we have um, 14 organizations that are part of our steering committee. CCAA is part, it's overseen by ILC Canada, and we rely strictly on donations. But it's not just the financial part that I'm talking about. Most of the work is done strictly by volunteers. Uh, there is no budget assigned um, or available to CCAA for we have no staff that are paid. So everyone on our team are volunteers. And our um, coalition actually provides most of the support for the work that's done individually uh, on, a, on a project by project basis. So um, we're hoping that over time, we will have a small budget to actually hire a couple of staff members. But at this point, it, we are looking at the team here, Margaret and myself, and we have a team of about 12 people who are volunteering with us, Margaret. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that answers your question or not. I'm happy to give you more details if you like. But it's it's strictly by by volunteers and donations for projects. There are two questions uh, on the, the chat, so I'll uh, uh, transfer over there. Are there countries that have been successful in um, combating ageism? I can definitely take a first stab at it, and Margie, you can join in as well. Sure. Um, so this to be so. Let me just give you a little more history. So Margaret, Margaret's been working on the ILC front for is it ten years? Well, ten years now. And I joined her soon after that uh, because I was still working full time at the Ottawa Hospital and I'm still connected to the Ottawa Hospital, but I've been able to take a dial it back a bit in the last couple of years. So it, it was and we were really working on the convention for most of those years. And honestly, I think we were I was struggling with what can we do at a national level to, to try and turn up the, the heat to make this happen better, to catalyze it, to galvanize things? And then we came across this brand new report by the WHO in March of 2021, because until that report came out, there was the coin ageism, the term ageism was coined by Robert Butler in 1969, who was a geriatrician. But the amount of literature between then and the WHO's report was just trickling in. There was awareness in some pockets, 
but there is no specific country that has done a phenomenal amount of work on ageism. I think Canada at this point, our CCAA is the strongest national movement. Australia and the UK are starting to work with us now but they're looking at us as a model uh, of, of how to create this. So Margie, would you like to add to that? I think you did an excellent job of answering that. I guess the only thing I would say, um, and thank you, uh, Suzanne, for that for that question, is that the fact that one in two persons is ageist around the world shows how much work needs to be done. I don't think, as Kieran said, there's really been anyone with a huge success. There are, however, programs, as we, we've mentioned in the presentation, um, that have been successful, and that's what we're trying to do in Canada. and. Uh, I, I think in some ways we're ahead of the curve because we've we really tried to make ourselves the first country that takes the world report from WHO and tries to implement it. So that's um, what we've been doing as Kieran outlined. You had mentioned that there was a policy paper recently. Um, I guess that was um, part of your special committee on ageism uh, or human rights that was just recently put out, could you name that policy paper or the white paper, whatever you call, and what was the background to that? Okay, are you talking about the Canadian papers that I mentioned? So there was an FPT um, paper of, by the ministers. I can probably get the, um, what I might do is I'll, I'll get the references and, and give them into your leadership so they can send it out to you. Uh, so there was one by the FPT ministers meeting, and then there was one by Stats Canada that looked at some of the negative impacts. And then there was also a paper I mentioned uh, that was spun by the National Seniors Council on ageism. So I mean, we, we were using this in other discussions, Kieran and I, to, to illustrate that the Canadian government has done some really good work to show what the impact of ageism is, but like, what the heck are you doing on the other side to fix it? And you know, not supporting the human rights of older persons doesn't make sense with that hand. And at the time that, I don't know if it's, it's been rec uh, uh, fixed in the last few weeks, but if you would go on global affairs, and look at um, their human rights piece, they never mention ageism in there. Yet the other side of government's doing all these papers showing how bad it is. So it, part of it is like, uh, hello, let's link these things up. So uh, th those are then the, the sort of Canadian ones. And Kieran's mentioned the international one from World Health Organization, which is, is really important to read. And I'll just add to that, and that's a really great question. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. I was going to say it would be very helpful, I think, if we got a link to that particular policy paper for those that are in that part of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Um, so just to add to this, so it's not just the Canadian government that is this big, huge, or like, it, it's too big, and one side doesn't know what the other side is doing. But that happens also at the World Health Organization. And let me give you a specific example. So in March of 2021, we see the Global Aid Report on Ageism being published. But by the end of 2021, the WHO was ready to publish the ICD-11, which is the International Classification of Diseases. That's the 11th um, edition. And in that iteration, they were going to list old age as a diagnosis. So old age as a diagnosis. So if you went to the hospital and you were older, you could be discharged home with the diagnosis of old age. And so, so that was like mind boggling. It's part of the WHO. One side says ageism, one side is... So we actually, across the world, we launched a massive global campaign to lobby against that. And we wrote several letters on Thanksgiving Day in 2021. Three of us, uh, uh, Dr. Alex, Alex Kalash from, uh, from Brazil, Julie Biles from Australia, and myself were on a call with the WHO for four hours with their scientific committee. And we we just went through it step by step, showed them the evidence, told them how how ages this is. It kind of goes against what WHO is trying to do. Um, and, and they actually, surprisingly, shockingly, rescinded that diagnosis. They took it away. And, and wow. so Brilliant. we were successful. And we actually published that in the Lancet as, as to how that took place. So if you're interested, I'm happy to share that with you along with anything else. And if anyone's interested in these slides, I'm happy to share 
any or all of them with you um, if it's helpful as well. Okay, <laughs> Batma has one last question then. My, my question is, how do we define Asia? For example, I look at the two leaders, the two people that are competing in the U.S., which is the most powerful U.S. Uh, powerful country, they're showing signs of not being able to stay awake, at least. And when we say we're concerned, is that considered Asia? Or, or where do we draw the line? Oh, who should be in a, in a certain position and who should play sports or who should whatever? That's all related to the age. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> So I, have, I, you have to apologize. I have to apologize because I didn't quite hear it well enough. So um, maybe you could just give us sure, a little summary. Yeah. yeah. So essentially, what? How do we really define ism, uh, ageism? And she was saying, you know, with all of the, with the, the, the two people running for president who are having a difficult time even staying awake at times. At what point do we then say, are we being ageist in saying maybe they aren't capable of doing these things or are we not? Am mm -hmm. I summarizing yes. that well? Yeah. So great question. Thank you for asking. And and Margie, do you want to try to go sure, in first? Sure. Or do you want, okay, yeah. Well, it doesn't matter to me, Kieran, if you feel, feel free. I've got the definition of, you've got the definition of ageism at your fingertips or do you want me to use the one from WHO? Um. I would just go with the WHO. Okay. One. Yeah, yeah. So it refers to stereotypes, how we think, prejudice, how we feel, and discrimination, how we act towards others or oneself based on age. Um, and, and so, you know, I, what worries me about the political piece, just as an aside, because I've used the ageist comments about those people in speeches before, uh, you know, during diff different times, is, um, is that sort of f fake idea that you can give a diagnosis to someone. And, you know, you, so you've, hear, you've heard that both of the candidates, you know, have dementia or whatever it is. You know, I think that's a terrible thing to be doing, and it's completely ageist to do that. And by the way, uh, getting up and being able to speak uh, in advanced age intervention just doesn't happen. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's absurd, um, but it is, it's a prejudice. And, and so I think mm -hmm. we have to call it for what it is, but that's yeah. my, my view. Kieran? Um, so uh, I can see some of you in the room. I'd like to ask you a question and uh, just by show of hands, how many of you know someone who is 90 or 95 who functions like they're 50 or 60? Okay, look around the room. Okay, how many of you know someone who who is forty or fifty, but looks they they function like they should have been underground years ago? <laughs> and you're you're laughing because the fact is, it's just a number. It's just a number. It that doesn't reflect. The, there's so many different ways to look at aging. I didn't show you that slide because we didn't have time, but there's a biological definition of aging, there's a psychological, there's a social definition of aging, and there's a functional definition of aging. And all of those things matter because depending on how you look at the aging process, you can define it differently. Now, I'm not Joe Biden's geriatric psychiatrist, and I I don't want to be. I don't want to be Trump's either. I just put that out there. But the, the fact is that we can't judge a person just based on their age. That's the point here. If they're functioning or their cognition or their behavior, now one is pretty suspect there, reflects that they're not doing well, then that's a whole different thing. We have a potential candidate who is going to be in jail, maybe. But again, that's politics. It's it's not science or medicine, and I I don't feel qualified to to comment on the two candidates in the U.S. But generally, if you look around the room, most of us are still functioning at a very good level despite our age. I'll be seventy years of age soon, and I feel very capable of doing the work I do. Um, so anyway, I'll just put that out there. And if anyone told me I can't. Um, I think I could prove them wrong myself, but I'll just be, I don't know if that answers your question, ma'am. 
<laughs> Not really, but I think one of the things to point out is if we saw someone who was 30 who also couldn't stay awake in a meeting, we would also yeah. be questioning yeah. their ability It'd be to questioning. Do job. Yeah, so good point. That's a to do with their age. Absolutely. Yeah. So no, and that's when that's but the point is well taken. That point yeah. is well taken. Absolutely, yeah. All right. So I think we'll wrap this up uh, just so we can uh, move on with our general meeting. You're, you're much more interesting than bylaws and motions, but but uh, we do thank you so much for your time. We yeah. very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really Please do consider joining the coalition if you're interested. Yeah, thank please you. do. Bye-bye. Thank you.